Chapter 38. I landed my stolen ship in a starfighter dock on Platform Prime, then popped my canopy. I turned off my hologram, and it felt odd to see my hands with their natural skin tone. And this place? Had these walls always looked so bleak? Everything on Starsight had been ornamented with color. Had this air always smelled so stale? I found myself missing the faint scent of trees and soil, or even the hint of cinnamon from Vapor's presence. Kimmelin met me at the cockpit, grinning like a fool as she climbed up the ladder, then grabbed my helmeted head in an embrace. She smiled, and I found the expression strange. Aggressive. Saints and stars? I hadn't been away that long. But as I stood up and embraced Kimmelin, I felt a lingering sense of disconnect, the feeling that everything in this universe was a painful noise, a remnant of the emotions that Delver had forced upon me. I tried so hard to banish that feeling. Hugging a friend should have been the most relaxing thing I'd felt in weeks. Yet a part of me writhed at it, not because of Kimmelin, but because of me. I imagined that she was hugging some kind of strange creature like an alien grub instead of a person. Did she know what I was? Did she even know that? Or did I even know that? Oh, the saints be praised, Kimlin said, pulling back. Spin, I can't believe it's really you. Jorgen, I asked. He's down below, planet side, on leave. I haven't seen him in a few days. Something about needing R&R? &R? Well, it happened to the best of us. I'd just been really hoping to see him. Maybe, maybe he could knock me out of this strange funk I'm feeling. What? Kimlin said. I mean, Jorgen explained he sent you on a mission. You really did it? You stole one of their hyperdrives? What about Mbot? My heart felt like it would rend in two. I... The klaxon alerts went off, blaring about an imminent attack. We both looked at the lights, listening as the intercom called all on-duty fighters to battle. I'll explain, I promised my friend. I'll try to, at least. After. Yeah, Kimla said. She gave me another quick hug. I was still standing in my cockpit, she on the ladder. Then she rushed down it and ran for her ship. My instincts fought for me to sit back down and fly into the fight, but Cobb had been firm. I was to come and report first. I climbed down and met Dwayne of the ground crew. He gave me a, gri a grin and a thumbs up and slapped me on the back for my heroic return. I looked at him, befuddled, trying to read the emotions on his face, which suddenly seemed strange and bizarre. I understood his expressions as if on a time delay, like I had to wait for an interpreter to translate them for me. Scud, what was wrong with me? You're just tired, I told myself. You've been pushing yourself hard for two weeks, all while living as someone else. Indeed, I was hit with a wave of exhaustion as I opened the door to walk into the hallway, but stopped and gave the unnamed superiority fighter a fond look. She was no Mbot, but she'd served me well. Would I ever fly her again? Probably not. She'd be torn apart and analyzed. Access to an undamaged Krill fighter was a unique privilege for the DDF. In the sterile, two metallic hallway, I found a pair of men from the infantry waiting for me. They offered an escort to help me find a way to Cobb, but I couldn't help but be reminded of the guards and guidance drones who'd accompanied me aboard the weights and measures. It wasn't that the DDF didn't trust me. It was just that the enemy was known to be able to affect the minds of people, particularly Cytonics. So, well, I guess they probably didn't trust me. Not entirely. It wasn't exactly the celebratory welcome home that I'd been anticipating. The men led me to a command chamber with a large view screen on the wall and several dozen small computer stations underneath, where members of Flight Command monitored individual flights and kept tabs on the enemy. They'd been busy while I was gone. The whole operation looked more smooth, with far fewer exposed panels than I remembered. Several junior admirals were directing the battle from command positions. Cobb stood behind them at the back of the room, looking distinguished in his white uniform, his silvery mustache bristling from his upper lip. They'd given him an imposing admiral's throne that overlooked everything. He used the seat to hold several stacks of paper and the armrest for his coffee as he inspected reports and muttered to himself. Nightshade? he asked as the guards marched me up. What the heck have you done here? Wasn't the mission Jorgen sent you on to be a stealth mission? You look like you darn near brought the entire superiority down on us. For some reason, hearing cops swear at me was the most comforting thing that could have happened to me right then. I let out a soft sigh. My entire universe was turning upside down, but Cobb was as constant as a star, an angry, surly star that drank too much coffee. Sorry, Cobb, I said. I got involved in superiority politics, and, well, I don't think I'm entirely to blame for this attack, but my actions did seem to provide some excuses for them to come, come here. You should have come back sooner. I couldn't. My, my powers. I'm learning, but, I mean, you tried to learn how to teleport using your brain. It's not as easy as it sounds. Sounds cut and hard. That's my point, he grunted. And the mission, the one you two made up without proper authorization? It worked. I pretended to be that alien who crashed here. I used Mbot's holograms to pull it off and lived among the superiority long enough to figure out the secret of their hyperdrives. 
I grimaced. I might have screwed things up here and there. Well, you wouldn't be you if you didn't make my life more difficult at every turn, Spin. He nodded to the guards and they withdrew. This conversation had in part been a test and I'd passed it. Cobb was reasonably sure that I wasn't an imposter. Imposter. Cobb took a sip of his coffee and waved me closer. What's really going on out there? The superiority has a bunch of factions. I didn't learn much. It's kind of over my head. But the military faction is reaching for power, and they're going to try to exterminate us to bolster their credibility. Getting rid of the human scourge as a way of proving themselves. On the screen at the front, which held an abstract battle map with dots of light representing ships, the Weights and Measures was deploying flights of fighters. It looked like several hundred drones of the normal style we fought, and 50 other ships glowing brighter than the rest. Piloted ships, Cobb said. Enemy aces, 50 of them. They're not aces, I said, but they are piloted ships. The superiority has been preparing a group of real pilots to fight us. I, um, trained some of them. Cobb's cup stopped halfway to his lips. You really managed to join their space force and train with them? Er, yes, sir. Darn, and that ship you stole, it has a hyperdrive? No, but I know the secret. You know that yellow slug pet I have, the one I found in Mbot's cave? Those are what the superiority uses to hyperjump. We need to send an expedition into the caverns on Detrius and see if we can catch any others. I'll put several teams on it immediately, assuming we survive this battle. Any other bombs you want to drop on me? I um, revealed myself to one of the highest functionaries in the superiority government, and we get along pretty well. I think we might be able to leverage this other faction in the government into making peace with us, uh, assuming we survive the aforementioned battle. And your ship, the one with the annoying attitude? I felt a spike of shame inside me. I left him behind, sir. And Tomb Slug. I was being chased by enemies and they were getting close and... It's all right, soldier, Cobb said. You're back, which is more than we had any right to expect. He turned his eyes toward the screen and the glowing flood of little blips of light. I want you in a debriefing room with a recorder telling us everything you can remember about their military capability capacities. I'll stay here and do what I can to survive this invasion. Scud, that's a lot of fighters. Cobb, I said, stepping closer. Those aren't bloodthirsty monsters out there. They're just people. Normal people with lives and loves and families. And what did you think you've been fighting all of these years? Cobb asked. I, I didn't know. Red-eyed, faceless creatures. Relentless destroyers. Not far from how they saw humans. That's what war is, Cobb told me. A bunch of sorry, desperate fools on both sides just trying to stay alive. That's the part of, that those stories you love leave out, isn't it? It's always more convenient when you can fight a dragon, something you don't have to worry you'll start caring about. But he took me by the arm, then moved some papers and gently steered me to sit in his chair. He didn't banish me immediately to that brief debriefing. Perhaps he wanted me around to answer questions. I sagged in the seat, watching as he stepped forward to take command. He was far better at that than one might assume. He didn't try to do it all himself. He let the other admirals, ones he'd handpicked for their combat sense, lead the individual segments of the battle. He only intruded when he felt he needed to. Mostly, he limped around the room, sipping his coffee and offering pointers here and there. I watched the swarm of ships approaching one another. I tried to sink further down into my seat as I watched. Red and blue blips on a screen, but some of those pet blips were people I loved dearly. People on both sides. Was Mortimer out there, terrified but determined? Hesho and the kitchen? Would Kimmelin shoot them down? This wasn't right. This couldn't happen. And it was also wrong. Not just wrong morally, wrong tactically. I stared up at the battle maps, and the superiority side looked impressive. 200 drones, 50 manned ships, our own, fifth, our own force of scrambled fighters would only number around 150. But we were the DDF, battle-forged and growing in skill each day, while the superiority fielded drone pilots trained to be non-aggressive and a group of new recruits with only a couple weeks in the cockpit. Winzik had to know his forces were actually at a disadvantage. He also knows we're growing stronger each day, and now, after finding the remnants of my destructor pistol, Fears we've been able to get to Starsight. He knows we have Cytonics. He knows we were spying on his operations. Suddenly, I saw a different cast to this battle. I saw a terrified Winzik realizing that his prisoners were out of control, that the threat he'd often used to scare the rest of the superiority was actually real. So what was his plan here? It had to be more than just letting his fledgling space force die to our destructors. As the two groups of fighters began to engage, I strained to put together what the Krell leader might be planning. Unfortunately, I'd never been the one to worry about large-scale tactics. My job was to get in the cockpit and start shooting. Sure, I could think on my feet and win a battle, but today I needed to be more. I understood the enemy better than anyone else. I'd lived among them. I'd talked to their general, listened to his orders. What was he doing here today? 
I watched the battle and slowly I stood up from the seat, the Admiral's chair, where I loomed over the entire room. I stared at the blips on the screen and saw the people behind them. I felt the world fading slightly around me. I saw and heard stars. Reporting live from the Detrius Refuge, brave fighters hoping to hold back the human scourge. Winsick was broadcasting these events. This attack was theatrics. I imagined millions of people back on Starsight watching the broadcast in fear. Winsick could destroy his reputation by failing here. And he would, wouldn't he? He couldn't defeat us. Reports that the humans are doing something strange. This refuge, which is surrounded by ancient mechanisms, remnants from the Second Human War. The movement of those platforms, something seems to be happening. Beyond it all, I heard something else. Like, like a building scream or a challenge. Was that Bray screaming into the nowhere? She couldn't do that. It would draw the eyes. It would... It snapped into focus. The things I was hearing, Kurt, Kuna's warnings, Braid's explanations from earlier, Winsick's plan. They were going to intentionally bring a Delver into our realm. A few of the people in the room noticed me, and Rick Holfer nudged Cobb. Spin, the Admiral said, stepping up. I need to go, sir, I said, still staring at the battle map. I don't know if we can risk you, he said. None of our other ships can protect your brain from cytonic attacks. Besides, we don't know if we can get any of these hyperspace slugs you mentioned. So, well, we might, you might be needed soon. I'm needed right now, I said. I looked down at him. Something terrible is about to happen. I don't think I can explain it to you. I don't have the time, but I have to stop it. Go, he told me. We might be able to defeat the fighters, but those battleships... Now that they've finally decided to throw everything at us, our time is running out. So if you can do something, well, go. Saints watch over you. I was off and running toward the hall before he even finished.